is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to. We were in, uh, we in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Yes, Ooh. sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow, <laughs> that brought a sing. So, I've probably done this, that's probably the 50th time I've watched that video. And every time, it's like regenerating my batteries. Because that's our job. You know, anyone can go on the internet and read what heart failure is. But our job is to give them the why. To understand why they're doing this. And if we can do that, well, it's easy for them to do what they need to do. If they understand if they do this, they will live longer. If they do this, they'll see their grandkids graduate from high school. They'll be able to walk their daughter down the aisle. And giving them that motivation on why I should be doing it makes this job really easy. Now, my personal story is I had a family member who had cancer. And when we went to the doctor's office, the doctor said, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And we said, okay. And we had really no control over it. We just did what they told us. But here, we're going to tell the patient, if you do this, if you do that, you have total control over disease. And honestly, it's not a lot. And that's why it's so important to give them the power to feel like they succeed. Because the statistics about heart failure aren't good. One in five people with heart failure die with a one-year diagnosis. The five-year survival rate is worse than most common types of cancer. And 50% of the patients do not survive 
from years after their first heart failure hospitalization. Those are some pretty scary statistics, mm -hmm. especially if it's one of your family members, you know? Now, this is the lifespan of heart failure. This is such an important concept because one is where a person is diagnosed. We get them in the hospital, they know they have heart failure, we get them on the right meds, we get them on the right diet, they're in a good place. They go to two. Now, between two and three, I can't tell a patient how long that is. It can be a year, it can be five years, it can be 10 years, it can be 15 years. What I do say to a patient is the better you are with taking your meds, the better you are with following up with your doctors, the better you are with your fluids and salt, the longer this line becomes. It gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And that's when weddings happen, graduations happen, celebrations happen, that trip to Europe you've always wanted to do. What I always say to patients is, is we have to worry about these dips. Now these dips are when you get readmitted to the hospital. Those are punches to your heart. Now we have to reduce the punches to your heart because research shows patients get four punches, four emissions. And after the fourth one, they often don't come back. So if you get admitted here, I can get you better, but notice your better is not as good as it used to be. And then this slope gets slippery and slippery and slippery. And that's our job. If I can push this punch out five years and then push the next punch out for another five years, another five years, they're living a productive life. And that's really our job, giving them the tools to do that. So in your information, there's a lot of great stuff in here, but there are four key principles that we teach to. What do you guys think are the key things about managing heart failure? What do we ask patients to do every day? Weigh, weigh yourself. Exercise is big. Mm -hmm. Weigh yourself. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is weight so important? That's what tells the fluid's building up. Exactly. Here's a funny statement. I don't weigh myself because I just wait for my legs to swell up. Why is that problematic? <laughs> you're already, you're already it's a late time. Exactly, yeah. The thing here is, is when your legs swell up, instead of just being three pounds over, usually swelling in your legs happens when you're two to three liters over. So now you're hmm. six to eight pounds over. And now when you call your doctor, they're very upset. So Robert, I don't know if you have the same problem at all in, uh, with your patients, but they may weigh themselves, they can't see the scale, oh. or they have a talking one, they can't hear, or they misinterpret what they're hearing. Yeah. <laughs> so you get one that you think would be bigger in number, but they still can't see it. So how do you... We often recommend uh, VNA services yeah, to do telehealth for yeah. those patients. Yeah. Um, we have had some patients with the success with the blind patients who have the speaking the ones. Yeah. Um, those yeah. are factors that are hard. And telehealth I love because it gives people a really good resource to help them track. Um, and it's important, but we have to reinforce to the patients that telehealth isn't always a long-term thing. You could be there three months, six months, nine months, but you still need to be doing the work on your own because when they disappear nine months from now, I don't want you to fall on your face. I want you to say, okay, they're not here, but I still need to do these things. Now, as I said, I spent a year doing research, and there's some really scary statistics. So, recent research, recent research showed that about 60% of the patients we are discharging don't actually understand what their diagnosis was when they were here. It's kind of scary. Oh, I'm sorry. Changing that around. 60% of the patients know what their diagnosis is. That means 40% of the patients don't. Four out of every ten patients don't understand why or what was done or what their diagnosis is. Now the other thing is, this is just a reality of life. I'm an M5 nurse, we have four patients a day, I would discharge all four of my patients and get a whole new four patients in a day. Eight patients in a day, remits, discharge, that's a lot. What this research is saying, that 60% of nurses survey at three local hospitals, not our local hospitals, are spending less than 15 minutes providing pre-discharge heart failure education to the patient. So before you show up with your discharge patient, that's saying that Nurses are spending less than 15 minutes talking about it. And that's nothing against nurses. I think that more speaks to what we battle on a daily basis, on how we're running and taking care of patients, that we don't have that time to sit down. And what we understand is, is as I said, it's not about sitting down for long periods of time and educating. It's about sprinkling in through your day. So how do we do that? All right, don't worry about this. Perfect. You said daily weights. Three pounds in one day, five pounds in a week. Now, when you have a patient with heart failure, I'm assuming this folder is given because there's a whole pathway in there. What we do at our hospital is we pull this out in the morning. And we say, good morning, Mr. Smith. Your weight was 140 today. 
and you were 132, you know, you were 145 yesterday. Wow, you've lost five pounds. And we make this a part of their day so they understand that we're looking at it and that they should look at it. And we, it really drives patients' care because they say to themselves, holy cow, I've lost 25 pounds since I've been admitted. And that really drives them to understand. All right? Now, we use the zones. You guys have this awesome piece of paper, too, which is very similar to our zones. And we teach our nurses that when you do your morning assessment, the first question you ask all of our patients is, is what zone are you in? Because if a patient can start understanding what zone they're in and have you as a sounding board, then they start doing this at home. So you're in the morning, Lexi, you're doing your assessment with Mr. Smith, and Mr. Smith came in with heart failure. You're doing your assessment, and he's got plus two pitting edema. You just got him from the bathroom. He's so short of breath, but he's lost two pounds, and he feels better. And you ask him, hey, Mr. Smith, are you in the green, are you in the yellow, or are you in the red zone? And he goes, I'm in the green zone, and I feel better. And he does feel better, because we've taken off so much weight for him. But that's your teaching moment. You have to say, well, Mr. Smith, take a look at your legs. They're still quite swollen. You know, and when I listen to your lungs, they're crackling. Notice when you walk from the bathroom, were you short of breath? Yeah. He goes, for me, I think you're in the yellow zone. And if you were at home, what would you do? Well, I should call the doctor. That's part of your assessment. It didn't add any more time to your day, but it provided a teaching moment for him to think about it. What are the five symptoms we want patients to look for? Waking. Waking, yes. Yeah. Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. <laughs> yes. Dry hacking cough, need to sleep in a chair, or more tired. Now, it's really important when you talk to a patient of shortness of breath, everybody always thinks about when they're at the kitchen table, I can't breathe, let's call the doctor. And I always tell patients that's too late. You know, you want the patient who last week can walk from the house to the car with no problems, but this week when they got to the car, they were winded. They sat in the car for a minute. A minute later, they were better, they drove to the grocery store. For patients, they never call the doctor because they always say, I got better, I didn't need to call. Mm -hmm. But that's when we want them to call. You know, I normally don't have an issue walking up the steps. This time I did, but I got better after a minute. Call. Perfect. Fluid. It's really important as a nurse to not coddle and do things for our patient. That's very hard. As a nurse, my job is to make them feel better, take care of them. But we aren't going to go home. Sometimes I think my wife would like me to go home with these patients and not come home. But our job isn't to go home with them. So we really need to empower these patients to manage it. So when you show up, Lexi, I keep using your name, I apologize. You're more than fine. So when you show up and a patient's on a 1500 fluid restriction, what we tell the nurses is don't say, hey, Mr. Smith, here's 500, you've got another 500 for the day. Hey, Mr. Smith, this is a 500 cup. Where are you? I don't know. Well, let's talk about that. What are you going to do at home? How can we help track it? Empower the patients to drive the bus. Now, is this going to work with every patient? No. But for most of them, it does. You know, if when you go home, what are you going to do? Let's take this time while you're in this perfect world to work on how you're going to track your fluids. We use trackers. We give all of our patients trackers. We make them write it down. We make them understand. All right, well, I'm at 1,500 and I only have 2,000. And it's 3 o'clock. I'm not going to have anything to drink. I'm going to wait until dinner. So it takes us from being the bad guy, and it puts it on them to hold themselves accountable for it. One thing we use is, um, so, often patients will not do what we say because it's just too much work. Okay? Now this is a 16.9 ounce bottle. Poland Spring sells them. What we tell our patients is, is buy four of these. When you go home, write one, two, three, and four. Every night you fill them up with whatever you like to drink. Water, milk, juice. So on and so forth. Four of these are 64 ounces. If they drink these four, they've tracked their fluids, they haven't gone over, but they actually haven't done any writing. And that's the key. Let's make it simple for patients, okay? <clears throat> we got a couple more minutes, and this is the best part of this conversation. All right? It's all about the salt. <clears throat> I always say to my patients, if you're going to get into a fight with your doctor about fluids or salt, they're always going to let you in the <laughs> not going to let you in that salt conversation. Now, for people with heart failure, we put them on a 2,000 milligram salt restriction. All right, that's assuming they don't have kidney issues or other big issues. Assuming all of us have normal hearts, we're supposed to be on a 4,000 milligram salt restriction. But most of us eat between six and 8,000 milligrams of salt 
a day. 2,000 milligrams seems like a ton of salt, but it is less than a teaspoon of salt in your food. And what we always hear from our patients, well, I don't have a salt issue, I don't salt my food. And that's great, because the hardest thing sometimes is to get the salt shaker away. But patients don't realize that one slice of bread has 150 milligrams of salt. They don't understand that that good old-fashioned American cheese is three to 400 milligrams of salt. That delicious cottage cheese is 800 milligrams of salt for one cup. And that's what we do from a teaching standpoint. So we do, we have on our floor, we call it the salt box. <laughs> and we literally have patients look at it and look at the salt in it. Because it's not just the salt, it's how to read a label. Because mm -hmm. nobody hears your wheat thins. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. So pasta is a wonderful thing if you don't have diabetes. Okay? If you don't salt your water, it has zero salt in it. The problem is, is when you crack Mr. Ragu out, Mr. <laughs> Bose, Mr. Prego, you get a tissue. So Erica, you at home, you poured this entire container and fed the family with it. How much salt did you consume? 480 milligrams. So that is great. Serving. Per serving, yeah. How many servings? How many servings, How many servings in America? There are five servings. Yeah. Wow. 2,500 milligrams of salt in that wow. container. It's a good thing I eat natural. <laughs> so what we tell patients are is don't buy this, but go buy Hunt's No Salt Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Hunt's No Salt Tomato Peas. Throw your garlic in there, throw it in. Mm -hmm. And we do say it's a thing, so make a huge batch of it, freeze it, you go from 500 to 100. Mm -hmm. That's a good choice. Makes pasta realistic. Now, I have little kids, so I am forced to eat hot dogs. Not that I like <laughs> hot dogs, I'm forced to eat that. But one hot dog, mustard, ketchup with a roll, 900 milligrams of salt. Wow. And you're only allowed 2,000 for a day. Now, I always eat two, and I always eat mm. big beans. All right, Kathleen, how many servings are in that little tiny, tiny, tiny can? Two. Exactly. And how much salt? <laughs> uh, let's see. 380 milligrams. Right. 800 milligrams. So that's another hot dog I've just eaten because, all honesty, I eat the whole can. All right? <laughs> so think about that. Two hot dogs, one of this, and that's one meal, and I've already done about 2,600 milligrams of salt. And I didn't have breakfast, I didn't have lunch. A good old-fashioned ham sandwich, two slices of bread, 300, two slices of ham, 550, one slice of cheddar cheese is 170, that little tiny ham sandwich, almost a thousand milligrams of salt. Now, our population are often elderly, and unfortunately sometimes their spouses die, and our men who don't cook, well, this is what they eat, mm -hmm. a can of progressive soup. So. We had a can of progressive soup. He ate the whole entire can. How much salt did he just consume? Uh, like 1,300 milligrams. Right, 1,300 milligrams. Now, we are not going to get that 85-year-old man to start cooking a piece of grilled chicken with kale and <laughs> rice. That's not going to happen. And that's not our battle to fight. But our job is to say, don't buy the progresso. Look at the healthy choice camels. Because if you do this, how much salt does he consume? Four hundred and ten. And how many servings? Two. Right. So that's eight hundred versus mm -hmm. fourteen hundred, and that's a good choice. You know, we always say TV dinners, and we go, oh, oh no 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 TV dinners. TV dinners are okay. You just gotta buy the right one. You know, if they're buying banquets. Marie Calendars, Boston Markets, we got issues. But if you tell them to buy a healthy choice or a lean cuisine, well, this fish, rice, broccoli, and a vegetable is only 500 milligrams. So these are the tools we can give patients to be successful. We're not going to change people. We just got to ask them to cook a little differently. Okay? And if we could tell them that and they understand that, well, they buy in. Because when you walk in there and say, well, you eat too much salt, oh no, I'm not giving up anything. Well, actually, all I just need you to do is instead of buying normal ham, go buy the low sodium ham. Now, well, does low sodium really make a difference? Now, you're going to see, and all of our patients will start looking at labels. And now our labels, they make it so easy. They've got light, they've got less, they've got 50% less, they've got no salt. Well, what do they all mean? 
So I've got a reduced sodium one and a low sodium one. This is a buck and this is two dollars. You have a patient who's on a fixed budget. He's going to say, well, they're both lower in salt. So what's the big deal? So he buys the reduced sodium. Jenna, how much salt's in that? 570. Per serving. How many servings? Four. Right. So that's reduced sodium. In your eyes, that's a pretty good choice. But if you bought the low sodium one, Lexi, how much salt would you get? 70 milligrams per serving right. with four servings. So 280 for the whole thing versus almost 2400 for this. Wow. Okay? And that's driven by the government. So the government wrote very strict rules. Reduced sodium means it's only 25% less. Low sodium means it cannot be greater than 140 milligrams per serving. So when you work with your patients, you just have to say, I would say, you can buy anything that says no or low. And that's totally fine. Vegetables. Frozen is great. Natural is great too. But the key thing is, is not canned. But if you do get canned, they have to be no salt. And people say, well, how much salt is in canned vegetables? <laughs> so. They have to last for five years. Yes. <laughs> so, salt. so uh, French cut green beans is a three and a half K serving container, and each serving is 400 milligrams of salt. So they're there with their wife, they cut it in half, well three and a half servings is 1400 milligrams, 700 milligrams just in those beans. Wow. Now, the beauty is that Price Chopper, Shaw's, and uh, Hannaford's now sell all no salt, no salt options. And they're the exact same price. 59 cents, 59 cents, they don't mark them up. So those are options for patients. Okay. Questions? we got about a couple more minutes. I'm going to go over a couple case studies. Um, what are some fluids that we don't want patients to drink? Sports drinks. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Why? Sodium. Yeah. Gatorade. Mm -hmm. A 32 ounce container of Gatorade has about 500 milligrams of salt. Mm -hmm. What's another big one? Sodas. Sodas is actually not that bad. Oh, yeah. 50 milligrams of salt. Not bad. Oh, yeah. This little can, five ounces, is 500 milligrams of salt. Exactly. You know, we are Vermonters. We love our milk. And I hate, I would wish to say this isn't true, but I've had patients who drink a gallon of milk a day. Granted, that's bad for their fluid restrictions, but one gallon of milk is 2,000 milligrams of salt. Every 8 ounce glass of milk is 125 milligrams of salt, and patients don't realize that. So they say to themselves, well, I'm doing cereal in the morning. That's a great low salt thing. Well, cereal has salt in it. About 250 milligrams of salt, 8 ounces of milk, now you're at 400 milligrams, and you didn't think you ate that much salt. An English muffin is 250 milligrams. Right. For patients, we tell them breakfast, eggs are fine. Oatmeal is a great choice. Lunch, we want tuna fish. Chicken salad, egg salad, PB&J, a hamburger, as long as it doesn't come from McDonald's or Burger King, is a great choice. Dinner, chicken, fish, pork, um, not ham, not bacon, not sausage. Some sort of vegetable, a potato's great, put a glob of sour cream on it, those are great choices. We're worried about meatloaf, stir fries, lasagnas. The things I always say, if you look at a plate and you're not really sure what's in it, that means there's a lot of salt. I know you asked about the wheat pills. 250 milligrams of salt for 16 wheat pills. That's the same for Ritz, Triscuits, but those, instead of getting 16, you only get six crackers. Now, the beauty is, is <laughs> all of these have now created a hint of salt version, and now you get the same serving, 16, 6, and 6, but instead of being 250, it's only 50. And those are realistic options. Cheese. I told you about American cheese, three to 400, cheddar cheese, is 170. The best cheese to eat is always Swiss cheese. It's not because it has holes and less cheese, but <laughs> 50 milligrams of salt for one slice of Swiss. And those are the little tidbits you want to just sprinkle in with your patients, you know? Hey, you're going to go home tomorrow. What do you think you're going to eat for breakfast? Give me three breakfast meals you're going to eat. Give me three lunch and three dinner. And work through them. Hey, let's do this, let's do that. So then when they leave there, the first couple of days, they have a plan. All right, we're going to do a couple case studies. We already read labels, but you guys did a great job. 
All right. These are your three options. Which is the saltiest? Cottage cheese. Cottage cheese, exactly. All right. Now, when I retire, I've worked very hard in life, and I don't want to eat in every day. I want to go out. I want to eat at a restaurant with my wife. I want to celebrate our anniversaries. I want to take my kids out. When you have heart failure, I don't want patients to think that they can never leave the house and eat a meal. You can go out. Now, the problem is, is which one's your best choice? Okay. What else you guys got? Hmm. I would say, say Olive chicken. Garden, but I don't know what that is. Wow. <laughs> right. Jeez. Now, these are all really bad choices. But the reason why I put Olive Garden, I put uh, McDonald's and Applebee's up there is per the government, any chain restaurant on their website has to list the amount of salt. Mm. So you can tell to a patient, hey, if you want to go to Outback, you can do that. Just go on the website before, see how much salt's in your food. Order it, and you're good to go. You can enjoy life. Now, if you guys live in, down here, Middlebury, great restaurants down here. I was at Rosie's over the weekend. And we don't know, because Rosie's is a one-chain place. And they're not going to list their salt. Mm -hmm. So what we say to patients, if you don't know the salt, well, obviously don't get things covered in gravy. Don't get the mystery meats. But at the same right, assume you're spending most of your salt in that meal. So for lunch, you want to do a salad with grilled chicken. Or you may want to do a little oatmeal at one of your meals to offset all that salt you spent at that one meal. The 2,000 milligrams is for the entire day. You can divvy it up however you want. Now, if I go to the Chinese buffet, am I going to make it in the ED tomorrow? Mm -mm. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Maybe, yeah, right? yeah, I'm sorry. Well, probably not. What's going to happen is I'll probably gain a pound or two. Mm -hmm. Then a month later, I go back to the Chinese buffet and gain another pound or two. And all of a sudden, now I'm getting short of breath. It's, all, it's not about that one moment. Because all of a sudden, said, hey, Chinese food, I can go to the ED. I can do that all the time now. What is he talking about? It's little things. So make them understand that, yeah, you can eat Chinese food, and you're not going to show up in the ED tomorrow. But what may happen is you gain a pound. And a month later, you do it again. Now you gain another pound. Five months from now, you're short of breath. you got swelling in your legs, and you've done damage to your heart. Cool. We talked about this case study number one. Got a couple of these. So, Mr. Smith is an 86 year old, admitted for shortness of breath, crackles in the lungs, and extreme fatigue with doing anything. His wife of 61 years died two months ago, and he currently lives alone. He is admitted due to congestive heart failure, which was diagnosed three years ago, and his EF is still 25%. What type of heart failure does he have? crackles, so. Left side. Left side for sure, yeah, because he's got crackles and things. Is it systolic or diastolic? It's systolic. Systolic, why? Because of his EF is low. Exactly. Awesome. So during your assessment, what education do you think you should provide? Of sodium mm -hmm. restriction and mostly be teaching his diet because he's all right. by himself. He probably didn't right. 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 Very important. Wife died two months yeah. ago. So just a key thing to focus on. Great. Two more, and we're done, guys. And I appreciate your time. It's been fun. So Mr. Jones is a 35-year-old independent contractor who was omitted for shortness of breath, extensive swelling up to his knees, a seven centimeter JVD, his BMP was 2100, and his tropes were positive at 2.22. Not a great story. The patient was found to have an EF of 20% and he had uh, and to have no blockages when he was cast. Huh. So his EF is down, but he has a clean course. So when assessing the patient, what things should you look for to see if the signs and symptoms are improving? Less swelling. Less swelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Decreased weight. Decreased He's a drug weight. user. JVD is mm -hmm. coming down. Mm -hmm. Those are things. Um, is it right or left sided heart failure? because of the JVD, mm -hmm. swelling in the legs. Knowing he had a clean cat and he's young for his age, what would be an appropriate question to ask about his lifestyle? Did you smoke? What did you do for recreation? Right. Right. Drinking, Alcohol. smoking, yeah. key things. Alcohol, if we catch it soon enough, the heart can reverse. But if they're doing it for long, long periods, it usually doesn't go back. 
Speaking of alcohol, alcohol can be drank with people with heart failure. For men, it's two drinks a day. For women, it's one drink a day. Right? And you have to qualify what they drink. Because I've often heard patients say, I drink two beers a day. And I go, sweet. Mm -hmm. Only to find out they're two forties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So really good. You know, nurses, we have to ask the right yeah. question. You know. Yeah. All right, last one. So Miss McClure called her PCP this morning as she was not feeling well. She decided to describe to the nurse that her BP over the last three days had been.